Einstein tells us that E equals MC squared. But what does that really mean? We need a more practical definition, something that we can use to explain our everyday lives. So let's turn to classical physics to get that definition. Classical physics defines energy as the capacity to do work. We're going to change it slightly so that we can include members of Congress in the Kardashian family. <clears throat> it's the capacity to do anything. Anything and everything that we do requires energy. Whether it's breathing, walking, driving a car, heating our home, firing a missile, it requires energy. Where does that energy come from? Well, for our bodies, it comes from food. That apple that you ate at lunch, your body converted it into chemicals that it could store and use them to generate energy whenever we need it, whenever we need to do anything. Aha, storage. So maybe storage is important too. Energy storage doesn't sound very sexy or exciting, but energy storage, the action of preserving energy in some form for future use, is abs absolutely essential for us. Now, what forms? There's a lot of different forms that we can store energy in. We can store it in mechanical energy. Uh, let's say winding a spring uh, for a clock. We can store it in thermal energy, heating up a bowl, a pot of water for cooking food. Chemical energy, we talked about food. There's also fuels, wood, gasoline, diesel, any type of fuel. We can store it as electrical energy. We can't create or destroy energy, but we can convert it from one form to another quite easily. For example, if I pick up this baseball, my body is converting chemical energy from the food I ate into mechanical energy, my motion. That energy is now stored in this ball. And I can release that energy at any time. Let's talk a bit more about electrical energy. Humans have a voracious appetite for electrical energy. Electrical consumption has grown by more than a factor of two in the last 25 years, and it's projected to double again in the next 25. The UN, several years ago, established a series of sustainable development goals Goal number seven is to bring reliable electrical power to everyone in the world. How are we doing on that? Well, not too great. One billion people in the world still have no access to reliable electrical energy. Why not? Well, we generate electrical power at giant stations, giant utility plants, and then we distribute it out on a grid composed of wires and substations to everyone who needs it. Not quite everyone. Yeah, we missed a billion people. We miss them primarily because they live in very remote areas, far away from the uh, grid, the end of the grid, where it's just too expensive to run it 600 miles for a dozen people. So we forget about them. They have no access to reliable electrical power. And that one billion doesn't even include the outages that are caused by grid failures or storms. And I'm not talking about the one or two hour uh, power outages that we've all had. Little inconvenient, but no big deal at all. I'm talking about months. A few years ago in India, one day the grid went out, 400 million people without power. Next day it got worse, 700 million people without power. 700 million people without power. And that lasted in some cases for a month. In Venezuela right now, huge power blackouts, crippling the company, the country and their economy. Happens in the US too. Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria, 
took 11 months to restore power to the island in some places. What does being without power for a month mean? Well, no lights, obviously. No pumps to bring fresh water. No sewage treatment. And perhaps cruelest of all, no way to charge your cell phone. So for those of us lucky enough to live in an area where we have reliable electrical power, where does it come from? Mostly, it comes from burning stuff. In the US, about a third of our electrical energy comes from natural gas. About a third comes from coal. And yes, we still use coal. And no, there's, not, there's no such thing as clean coal. Um, about 20% comes from nuclear energy. And the remainder comes from a variety of sources, hydroelectric, geothermal, solar, and wind. But what happens when we, when we flip that light switch? Well, we expect the light to come on immediately, right? But the electrical grid actually has very little energy storage for uh, direct electrical energy storage. We can store huge mounds of coal, we can store natural gas in tanks, but we're not very good at storing electrical energy itself. The U.S. maintains a petroleum, strategic petroleum reserve, about 700 million barrels of oil. That's enough if we were to lose all our ability to produce domestically, all our ability to import oil, that's enough to last for 45 days. Our electric storage capacity, about 30 minutes. So when you turn on that light switch, what happens? is the grid operator injects a little bit more natural gas in the gas turbine, it spins a little faster, generates a little bit more electricity, and the light comes on. Our utilities have to match, because there's no storage, our utilities have to match their production to consumption. And they do that all the time. That makes it really hard to bring wind and solar onto the grid, doesn't it? Wind and solar aren't always there. If we don't have a way to store them efficiently, then they're of little use. Most of it goes to waste. So it's really hard to incorporate it onto the grid. So how much electricity do we use? Globally, it's about 21,000 terawatt hours per year. Nobody knows what a terawatt hour is. But you, you probably know what calories are, more or less. So I converted it for you. I don't know what that number is, but it's big. <laughs> it's really, really, really big. Um, we use a lot of electrical energy. And like I said, it's going to double in the next 25 years. How are we going to meet that demand? Well, let's just burn more stuff, right? Uh, I have a little bit of a problem with that. And the problem is that anytime we burn anything, we emit carbon dioxide and it goes up in the atmosphere. And most of you probably recognize that that leads to climate change. On the right is a dynamic plot of average global temperature since the year 1850. As that circle gets larger, that means it's getting hotter. You'll notice when it reaches present day that it gets pretty hot. And in fact, the four hottest years on record, anybody want to guess? 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Coincidence? Um, I don't think so. But if you're a skeptic, and maybe you don't believe there's a connection between the plot on the left and the plot on the right. Let me pose this question. Wouldn't it still be better if we didn't burn so much stuff? Let's save the stuff we can burn for where it's most efficient, like for generating heat. We've got lots of different ways we can generate electricity. 
many of them better than burning things. So let's come up with a new plan. Our new plan is going to be a five-step plan. We're going to have an enormous power plant. And let's make it a nuclear power plant. Ooh, silence. Uh, maybe you don't like nuclear power. It's pretty clean, actually. The real reason that you don't like nuclear power is because you don't want it near you. So let's do it far away. And let's use fusion instead of fission. So let's put it very far away, let's say Kansas. <laughs> but I have relatives in Kansas and I still like a few of them. Um, so let's put it even further away. Let's put it 93 million miles away. Um, fortunately, there's already a big nuclear power plant 93 million miles away and we call it the sun. Let's convert that nuclear energy to electromagnetic energy. It's just a fancy term for heat and light. And instead of running an extension cord to get that energy, let's beam it to the Earth in the form of heat and light. So Mother Nature's already taken care of the first three steps in our five-step plan. Pretty good, huh? Step four, we need to convert that to electrical energy. We already know how to do that. We have solar panels that work pretty efficiently and convert sunlight directly to electrical energy. And in fact, in many areas of the world today, it's cheaper to generate electricity from solar power than it is from natural gas or coal. Cheaper. The problem is it's not always available when you flip the switch. So we need that last piece. We need that storage. Remember I said we need energy? We also need energy storage. So let's convert that electrical energy to chemical energy for storage. How are we going to do that? Well, how about a battery? Batteries are great, but they're kind of expensive. And they also have some nasty things in them. We need a new battery, and it's got to be really, really cheap. And let's get rid of the nasty stuff. So let's not use lead. That's horrible in the environment. Let's not use lithium. Uh, that lithium mining is horrible. Let's not use cobalt. Cobalt's mined by 10-year-olds in the Congo under unsafe conditions. Let's get rid of all that. And let's use organic materials, all organic materials, maybe a little water and a little salt. And then, Let's model our new battery after something that we know very well and has worked very well for over 100 years. The engine in your car, the internal combustion engine. <laughs> you guys think I'm nuts. <laughs> and that may be, but the test results don't come back till Friday. <laughs> but, but hear me out. If we model it after the car, we can make a battery that stores chemical energy in the form of liquids in tanks, just like the gas tank in your car. It's pumped to a central engine. In this case, the engine is an electrochemical cell rather than uh, the true engine that you're more familiar with, more, rather than an internal combustion engine. And that electrochemical cell can now convert our chemical energy into electrical energy directly, cleanly, without CO2 emission, we've removed combustion from the internal combustion engine. Is this a pipe dream? Actually, these already exist. We know how to make these. And they work. They're not perfect, but we're striving to make them perfect. And I envision a day in the not too distant future where we have these giant batteries located next to solar farms. Solar farm collects the electrical energy. We store it in the giant battery, which might be as big as this entire building. And then it's distributed out onto the grid to everybody who wants it. Well, almost everybody. What we're also working to do, and this is the cool part, 
we're working to make them smaller and cheaper, small and cheap enough to power small communities and even individual homes. And that way, we can disconnect from the grid entirely. We don't have to run the wires to every home that's 600 miles away from the nearest grid, grid point. That gives us a way to finally bring 100% reliable solar-derived power on a 24-7 basis to those one billion people that didn't have it 15 minutes ago. Thank you.